And Lord, it's in all that we have sung and proclaimed already and, and heard. Uh, Lord, you are Lord. You are the sovereign God. You are over all the nations, over all the earth. There is nothing that can be said or done to change that or to disprove that. And uh, Lord, we are grateful that you are our Lord. And in these next few moments that we share together, Lord, I pray that, that uh, you would take us through each moment of it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, a few uh, years ago, I told a story, and it's called Jimmy and the Native American. I don't know if, uh, if you remember that story, um, but it goes like this. Um, it's about a fellow, about a guy by the name of Jimmy, and he was walking out on the streets of New York City, and he found a new friend, and his, his new friend that he had met happened to be a Native American. And uh, there couldn't have been a better person for this, this First Nations fellow, well, I don't know if he's called First Nations out in, in the U.S., but this Native American, he, there couldn't have been a better person for, this, for him to meet than Jimmy, because Jimmy was just the, the ultimate host. He was so gracious, and uh, he was walking up and down the streets with this fellow, uh, pointing out significant buildings and landmarkers and so forth. He wanted this fellow, his new friend, to have the best New York City experience that he could have. And so Jimmy was doing his very, very best to, uh, to make that experience pleasant and memorable. And while walking down the city streets, you can imagine what New York City would be like. I've never been there, but I can imagine. I can imagine, and I hear the hustle and bustle and the horns and all that, the sounds that are going on that, that kind of take place within the city. And as they're walking, this Native American goes, shh, shh Jimmy. So do you hear that? And Jimmy knows that there's something significant that he means, that there's something that, that, he, that he is supposed to hear. And this fellow says, listen carefully. Listen for what you are not accustomed to hearing around here. And so Jimmy, he's straining, he's listening, he's trying so very hard to pick up on the sound that uh, this Native American is wanting for him to hear. And finally, Jimmy says, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to be hearing. I don't know what I'm supposed to be listening to. I, I hear horns. I, I hear the, the people clamoring around. I, I hear all kinds of hustle and bustle that happens in the city. What am I supposed to be hearing? Crickets, Jim. Crickets. Can you, can you, right there, can you see it? There's crickets here. And uh, then Jimmy says, you know, how in the wide world can you hear crickets in this city, the busiest city in the United States, one of the busiest cities in the world for that matter, Ah, uh, Jimmy, you are accustomed to hearing uh, what you want to hear, and, and, and that will make one miss out. But people are like that. That will make people miss out on the small and seemingly insignificant things that are small and wonderful. Distractions will do that. They will make you they will miss out on something. Let me show you what I mean. And, and with that, he pulls out a handful of coins, and he dropped them under the concrete sidewalk. And the moment those coins hit the ground, they started bouncing. Clean, you know, the sound that they would make. Almost every head that was within earshot of those bouncing coins turned because they knew, they knew that sound. To see Jimmy, people will hear, they're accustomed to hearing what they want to hear. And they'll sometimes miss out on the small and insignificant things, but yet they're wonderful. Well, you know, crickets, are they small and wonderful? Um, maybe that's debatable. But, you know, when we were living up north, and, um, the one thing that I always told people, being from southern Manitoba, living in northern BC, you know, the one thing that I always missed that I would tell them was I missed the warm summer nights. I missed the warm summer nights and the sound of the crickets. That's what I missed when we were up there. Uh, but crickets being a small wonder, well, they kind of were to me, so. But uh, the point of, the short, of that short story, you know, there's something to it, and it is this, is that all around us can be found uh, very large distractions, and they're demanding, and they demand our attention sometimes. But yet, they are not the important things that matter most in life. And this is what comes to my mind when I think of our reading in 1 Kings 17 that uh, Pauline had read. And let me explain why I think this. When you leaf through the pages of 1 Kings, you're, you're going to discover as you move along, as you kind of reach the middle of that book, um, that, there, that there is, you discover that there's many nations that are listed. And they are all seem to have odds with somebody. They're in conflict with someone. And, and, or with one another. And there's this constant challenge that you find within kings, really, throughout all of the Old Testament, that mentions nations and people groups. The strain and the struggle to get along and be civil with one another is a constant challenge. But you know what? You have to appreciate that challenge, too. 
going to First Kings. Each each nation or people group they have their own set of issues, and the ones that are thriving they're growing in numbers. And resources such as food and water and land to grow things, those kinds of resources, they grow thick as the borders of those nations begin to bulge. And when those borders begin to bulge, and you begin to find it very difficult to provide for your own people, what do you do? Those are no small decisions for kings and rulers to deal with. What would you do if you were in that place? Well, many of the kings, they had tried, they, many of them would try to negotiate try to work something out, while others, they would maybe bypass negotiation, or if negotiation didn't work, they would then, as you often you see within the Old Testament, particularly the kings, they would try to solve their problems by using force and dominating a smaller, weaker nation or people group, taking them over. It was a cruel, cruel world. And we're given a chronology of the kings who had ruled in first kings. And within the first few verses of when they introduce a new king, we're told that they either did good or they did evil. And we're also informed, too, that fewer and fewer in numbers are becoming the prophets of Yahweh or the prophets of God. Yet, there's other prophets and priests that are beginning to pop up, and they belong to other kingdoms. And they're ones who either had abandoned or had no regard for the living God. And they were following a different, called Baal. And what we see developing is a real conflict of interest that affects Israel too. And ultimately what we see happening is they are being led to a question or to a point of decision in choosing. Now whom will we serve? Whom will I serve? Baal or the God of Israel? And the prophets of God, as I said, they are far and few between. And there's one prophet that we read of most in Kings, and that's Elijah. And Elijah was a most interesting character. He is he's passionate, and he's fearless, and he's brazen, and yet he's as normal as any of us are. Where we can maybe be that in one moment, but we're also prone to other things. He was also scared and anxious, and he was irritable too. And this prophet, God would use him to make a statement, to make a statement to the nations, because of all the turmoil and the unrest among the nations and, and this exaltation of this false god Baal, God was about to display to them just who he was and is. And you can feel the energy as you're reading through 1 Kings. You can, you can feel the energy just building up uh, and, and it's coming to this pending confrontation and it's stirring to a climax as yet another king is introduced and his name is Ahab. And Ahab, his wife, Queen Jezebel, probably heard of that, right? Jezebel is a very negative term today, isn't it? It isn't a name that anyone would necessarily give to one another unless they really wanted to insult them or make a point or a statement. But these two, they had a mandate, where they like, seemed like a personal little mandate that they had, that they were going to wipe out from the face of the earth the prophets of God, get rid of them. And everything that was wrong in their world, in the eyes of Ahab and Jezebel and those like them, the prophets, it was much their doing because of the things that they were saying. And even there was a horrific drought that was going on during that time too. Well, that too, the prophets weren't helping anything because they're saying all these remarks that are saying, you know, it's because of this, your neglect for God, that this is all happening. And you're not confessing, you're not repenting, and it's only getting worse. Well, people like Ahab and Jezebel did not like those kinds of remarks. And so the place to start and making things better is to get rid of the prophets so they're no longer saying the words that anyone really, that those like them really didn't want to hear anyway. That was the place to start. And finally, as we go through Kings, um, Ahab catches up with Elijah and he has him where he thinks it's a good spot. He has him where he wants him. And it was a moment that he had been waiting for. And before he's going to put Elijah to the sword or whatever it was, he was how he was going to put, him to, put an end to him, he agrees to a challenge, to a showdown that Elijah puts before him. How about this? The God of Israel versus the God of Baal, which everyone can bring rain down from the heavens and burn their respective altar. That will be the proof. That will be the proof which God is ruled. That will be the proof of which God is most powerful. The proof of which God is alive and active. And there on one side is Elijah. And with a line in the sand, there's 400 others, prophets of Baal and Asherah. And so much of First Kings is detailing the turmoil that is leading to this climactic event. 
It's detailing turmoil between nations, the decline of spirituality among the people, in particularly even the people of God, where many big issues are taking place one after the other. And then we know that there are bigger events about to come. And then in the middle of all this, there's the mention of a widow, of a young widow, assuming she's young because she's looking after a young son who cannot look after himself. And she's, she is mentioned in the midst of all these overarching battles and antagonisms of, of wars, of disagreements, of drought, of lack of rain and food and differences in religion. And, and what place does her story have in all of this? Because you don't want to know that series like an interruption, doesn't it? Well, the story has within it a miracle. This little, or this widow, she has little to nothing. And when we find her being mentioned here, she's foraging up just sticks just to start a fire she, so she can prepare a meal with the little that she has. And after that meal that she is going to prepare, we're told that she's got nothing left, that she's going to have to think of something to sustain herself with. And so when Elijah happens to come by and tells her to prepare something for the three of them, well, she knows full well what that's going to mean for her. And she expresses that to Elijah too. Yeah, I only have I only have a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. But Elijah assures her that it's all going to work out. Just don't fear. Just just do it. Your flour and your oil. It's not going to be spent until the rain finally arrives. You're going to have it. It's going to be there. It's not going away. This is what the Lord has told me. And you know what? Rain at this point in time it hadn't fallen for years. It wasn't like a matter of a few days. It hadn't fallen in years. But she complies. She honors his request. And you know what? She never did run out of flour or oil until the rains come. That came. And so, like, it's a miracle, isn't it? In the midst of national and political calamity, here's this miracle that takes place. And like so many other miracle stories, it's more than just a good story. There's more to it. And what would it be? Well, I think that there are two things that immediately come to mind. The first would be this, is that God is never too busy for the seemingly insignificant. It's a miracle in itself to me that with all that was going on in the known world at this time in 1 Kings, all of the fighting, wars between people, fighting for land and resources that's going on, fighting in the name of God and religion. And then there was this tension of a drought that was heightening everything. People were starving to death. But with all of these big issues and problems, the plight of a young widow and her son does not escape, does not escape the attention of God. It doesn't escape his eyes, his eye. It doesn't get past the Creator, the living God. And he reaches down into her situation, and he reigns hope into the barrenness of her circumstances, and she wasn't just going to be collateral damage because of a misdistribution of resources in her world. You probably remember this old song. Famous old song. I don't even know what era it comes from. 70s, maybe not 70s, probably maybe 60s. But the lyrics of the chorus kind of go, um, you know, why should I feel discouraged? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know. He watches me. So I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know. And I know what? He watches me. And I think this is why the story of this widow is, of this widow is told here. And why telling this story matters, because God cares. God cares about all things. God cares about all people. Everyone matters. And he's not too busy. His eye was on the widow. His eye was on her son, on Elijah. And his eye is on all of the sparrows. His eye is on you and I. And he sees right into your heart right now. Your situation. And he'll breathe hope and life in you. Filling your lungs up with, with that fresh air that feels so good. Giving you the assurance that you are loved. And that no matter what is going on. And no matter what the big important things of the day are in this world that feel so large, that maybe make your situation feel small, insignificant, where you feel you'll go unnoticed and unheard, 
God says this, that isn't so. That is not so with me. Because I knew you as you were being formed in your mother's womb. God will not forget. And that's one reason. And here's another reason that I think is, is equally as important. Despite the situation of the widow, her lack of resources, and how her situation would have made her feel, uh, she chose to feed Elijah still. That's, that's something very significant to me. That even though Elijah met her when she's at the lowest of her resources, she chose to honor his request still. And why? Because Elijah was a prophet of God? He was that. But I don't even know if she knew that. And, and how identifiable would a prophet of God have been in that day? They would have looked a little different. You know, they're, they're running. They're on the run. Elijah was certainly on the run. And I don't think he would have been as identifiable as maybe some of the other prophets that were of the other religions, of Baal and Asher and so forth, uh, who wore the rings and, and the headpieces and the robes and so forth. Elijah would not have looked like that at all. He was like a fugitive on the run. And if depleted in resources, as the real was, I think it would have been well within a reason to say, you know what, sorry. I wish I could help you, but I can barely help myself. I can't. And so why does she comply? Maybe it's this. Maybe it is because she saw something within Elijah that she herself could identify with. Because you know what, Elijah met her when he was very low on resources too. He was hungry too. And he was also desperate and he was feeling the effects of a very cruel world as well. Being led by cruel people. And here's the other point of telling this miracle story. The widow's openness to share what she had, even when vulnerable, she still recognizes the plight of another who was also in a difficult time, and she chose to reach out still. And you know what? I think that this is what real faith is. To not only acknowledge and discern what matters deeply in life, but then to choose to do something about it, even though it might cost you something, even though there might not be immediate relief or that might, the immediate result might not be relief that comes to you from choosing to do what you believe you must do. It's really very similar to the story in Mark chapter, um, was it chapter 12, with the widow that is mentioned there. She had only two copper coins to rub together. But she throws them into the treasury anyway. A treasury that was for the purpose of helping the poor. Well, wasn't that a story about giving? Yeah, it's, it is that in one respect. Although one could say, is it really wise to throw everything you have so you've got nothing left? Um, where your survival is jeopardized? That's a good point too, but it's missing the point of the story. The greater purpose of the story, I think, is the same as 1 Kings 17. It is about faith, putting feet to faith with works that flow from an inner conviction that will not allow one to sit on their hands or to minimize faith initiatives with small tokens of supposed giving and poor effort. And Mark's story exposes the religious leaders of the day. But Jesus did that of their hypocrisy. And they have much, and they're not generous with what they have. They walk around with an air of entitlement with no regard to what matters most in life. And it's people who matter most. They matter most to God, whose eye is on all. And so we must be on guard that our heart will not grow cold to what does matter most. And there is always a way to measure where we're at. There's always a way. The question really is this. Is there anything within me? Is there anything within me that I must address and do something about? Is there a certain something within me that is preventing me from agreeing in my heart and spirit with the two greatest commandments of God, to love Him above all and to love others as He loves me? When we choose to follow God, accepting and believing His message to us. It moves us. It moves us to seek a genuine and pure heart. And in being filled with the love of God, we give that love away. That is our response. And it will change the world. It really will. It will, it will replace cycles of violence and peace. It will work toward restoring our world in every conceivable way. Relationally, between individuals, even between nations, it will do that. The message of Jesus is can save. It will reconcile, it will heal, and it will restore. But there are as many in Jesus' day, and there's many in our day too, that will say, you know, that is a utopian kind of agreement. It will never, ever happen. Even if that can be proven true, and even if that were so, you tell me, 
what better way is there to go for? What better way is there? What more would there be for? What would there? What more would there be to look forward to if we did not embrace the message of Jesus? This is what it would be. It would be more cycles of violence. It would be more cycles of offense, more political and international tension that would become even more tenuous, where more is at stake with each confrontation that happens to come up. But to those, to those who believe the message of Jesus, who actually believe that another world, another kingdom is possible, that Jesus is in fact right, the message of Jesus, though unprecedented in its vision, though requiring immense faith to believe that anything and everything is possible, to the believer and to the skeptic, the message of Jesus is the only authentic saving message that the world has. It's the only saving message that we have. And I think that the widow of Zarephath lived by this, and so did the widow in Mark 12. God cared enough to meet them where they were at, and he meets us where we are at, always, he does. Now what does the love of God stir within you? What does it do? A compassion for the brokenhearted? Whatever it is, whatever and however, may we have the faith that is willing to not only be exercised, but stretched, challenged, willing to risk, to risk hurt, maybe even rejection. And above all, above all, may we be willing to share the Christ's life in our time, in our day, in our age. Because every little sparrow counts. Every little sparrow matters. Everyone, everyone. There's a song that we've sung a few different times, the servant song. And I think it kind of it captures everything that we have we've kind of spoken of here. Well, being a servant of all. Let's stand in closing and sing that song.